the front range the urban corridor that runs from Cheyenne in Wyoming to Pueblo in Colorado, passing through Denver, currently has a population of 5 million people and growing. This urban corridor currently only has one major way of travelling north-south through it, and that is the Interstate 25. There is currently no region-wide passenger rail, which as you can expect causes problems when travel is so heavily dependent on a single road corridor. Despite this, the front range has many traits that suit high speed intercity rail. The base of the front range mountains features mild geography. The cities are positioned within a linear corridor. Its central metropolitan area, in the form of Denver, already comes with a decent transit system, and overall, the travel corridor is relatively short in high-speed rail terms. If we think of other classic high-speed rail corridors, it's shorter than London Lyle Paris, it's shorter than Madrid Barcelona, Paris Lyon, Tokyo Osaka, or Milan to Rome. Yet in spite of that, I don't think the front range is frequently discussed when it comes to high speed rail. If you look at City Nerd's video on good high speed rail pairings in the United States, it doesn't get mentioned there. This bright line graphic of the kinds of places they would like to expand doesn't feature it. This is probably largely down to population considerations, something I will briefly touch on at the end of this video. But I think a statistics only approach to determining the worth of a front range high speed rail corridor is probably missing some of the real benefits it can provide for a relatively modest price. Amtrak's own estimate for a front range passenger rail service using conventional trains at conventional speeds puts travel time on the entire corridor at 5 hours and 34 minutes. That is not faster than driving, but I think it is still a tempting value proposition when it's priced reasonably and you add on the appeal of it's a way of avoiding traffic. This is a good idea Amtrak should go forward with, but I am of the opinion that this service should be a stepping stone for full high speed service, one that can be built within reasonable engineering and budget constraints. A rail service with an average speed of 160 kilometers an hour would offer a Pueblo to Cheyenne travel time of 2 hours and 15 minutes, which would be a massive competition boost against road vehicles. Notice that I've used 160 kilometers an hour as the average benchmark here, rather than say 300 kilometers an hour. Part of that is for consideration of the fact that trains need to slow down and make stops, but it's something I want to emphasise, like in a video I have already made, which is that you don't need full 300 km an hour operations to get the, all the benefits of fast high speed intercity rail. And that is something I want to keep in mind when doing this. I am not proposing a route that would be top speed all of the time from city to city. But rather, I want to keep in mind a reasonable budget and scope of the project, sticking to existing transportation corridors, avoiding cases where significant land acquisition would be required, and taking advantage of downtown cores and past station locations to build on areas that already have decent amounts of density to support passenger demand. I hope the purpose of this video is to get people's imaginations going into what this kind of service could look and feel like, and hopefully demonstrate that when it comes to high speed rail in the United States, the front range certainly does have a lot going for it. We begin our journey in Cheyenne, Wyoming. I think the thing I want to single out in Wyoming is the fact that the historic depot which serves as the centre of the city is still present and standing where it's currently a museum. I think one of the neat parts about the potential of this project is just the ability to use these historic stations as passenger stations again. Being able to step off an electric high speed train, going through one of these stations and coming up into a classic American main street. La, la, that is one thing that China's high speed rail will never be able to do. 
To explain the next part of the journey, we need to fast forward a bit and have a look at the route to Denver. As you can see, the most direct route to Denver is undoubtedly through the I-25. But I think if you're looking to save costs by sharing the corridor, I'm not sure that fully following the I-25 is the best idea. Especially when you get into Denver, the development around the I-25 can be quite dense and difficult to build around. Therefore, my proposal is that we instead focus on a Greeley to Denver route, adopting the existing railway alongside the US-85 as the core of this part of the route. This presents us with a new interesting decision to make, which is, from Cheyenne, do we decide to go to Fort Collins or Greeley? I think I propose this as two different ways this could work. The first is that we go from Cheyenne to Greeley with a separate branch for Fort Collins services, either through a shuttle or just a second line on the system. The second option is that we do Cheyenne to Fort Collins, then go to Greeley where we continue south to Denver. Both of these options have their advantages and disadvantages. The single line option is about 21 kilometers longer than Cheyenne to Greeley, and assuming a 160 km an hour average speed, the Greeley option is about 8 minutes faster, although that does not account for the extra stops at Fort Collins and Windsor, or that the track around Fort Collins will have slow speeds as you navigate the bends. I think around 20 to 25 minutes longer on this option would probably be the more accurate estimate. I think between these two, I probably prefer the branch option, for I wouldn't fault anyone for thinking that doing just a single line might be better. Downtown Fort Collins is close to Colorado State University and has a very interesting and pleasant downtown. Greeley is probably the worst offender on the route of a downtown with a lot of dead space, but to look on the bright side, that does also mean there has lots of TOD and potential to grow. The downtown characters of a lot of the stations on this route, what they currently are and the potential for them to grow in the future, is definitely one of the big appeals on this project. Going onwards, Greeley to Denver, we continue following the US-85 and make a single stop in Brighton along the way. Brighton has a very nice main street. It would be cool to see it served by rail. Going through Denver, I think the best place for a station is probably right next to the Union Station Light Rail Plaza. There's already extra space for tracks here. It puts you within walking distance of not just the rest of Denver's downtown, but also the main Union Station. In terms of places in the United States like where you could just slot in a high-speed rail station without having to tunnel straight through the city centre, I don't think it gets much better than Denver. I do want to mention briefly that the biggest snub in this plan is probably the fact that we're not going to Boulder. Just to keep costs and engineering considerations down, the route via Greeley probably means that you can't easily surf Boulder, unfortunately. I think in an ideal world, a more conventional intercity service would serve that Denver to Boulder to Fort Collins route very adequately and would definitely complement the high-speed service very well. To go south out of Denver, we once again follow the line adjacent to the US-85, and I also propose another stop at Littleton. Littleton has a charming downtown, and another connection to the light rail. This is a great kind of secondary station for Denver to have. We continue following the US-85 until Castle Rock, where another station will go. I think my preference for station is that I would go here, with this Rawbridge bridge pedestrianised for a direct route into the downtown. As mentioned, a lot of the towns have very pleasant walkable downtowns, 
and these could very well be destinations in their own right, driving passenger traffic, even if, on paper, these aren't massive cities. South of Castle Rock, the line will join the I-25, where it could run alongside it or by the median, Brightline West style, in order to save on acquisitions. This will go all the way down until we get to probably the biggest oddity on the route, and that is the United States Air Force Academy. Amtrak's current proposal includes a stop here, which may seem odd at a glance, but considering that this academy is open to the public and has several attractions, including a major sports stadium, this may be an interesting place to consider a stop. I think my preference would be to have the line branch off the I-25 just north of the airbase, where it would join the existing Colorado Springs subdivision with a station about next where to the airfield is right now. If for one reason or another you can't get access to the Academy with a new high-speed rail project, the next place to join in with the Colorado Springs subdivision is probably here, though that is a bit of a tougher engineering challenge. From there, we roll into downtown Colorado Springs, and another historic railway depot. Thankfully, the final stretch from Colorado Springs to Pueblo is a lot less complicated. We follow the existing rail line to Fountain, where we then turn south and join the I-25 for the remainder of the route, before finally branching off for access to downtown Pueblo. I think either one of the two lines that go into the city from the north is a valid route for the front range high speed rail to take. Overall, I would say that this hits a lot of major destinations within the front range, provides a massive a massively efficient alternative to driving on the I-25 and serves and just provides a and just provides a convenient service to a growing mega region within the United States. So with that in mind, why doesn't the front range high speed rail get much discussion? I think it's fair to say that even though 5 million is a solid number for a metropolitan area, having it be spread out through relatively small towns and cities definitely hurts some of the more statistical analysis of the line. I think treating this project as a programme for growth, aside from just whether or not it'll get record-breaking passenger numbers day one, is a good way of looking at the project. And I think overall, thanks to just the ability to avoid the I-25, this is a project that would get passenger numbers that punch above what it would get from a more traditional statistical analysis of the line. I hope at least part of this proves that high-speed rail on the front range for a reasonable cost is plausible and it gets your imagination going as to what it could look like. Also, this would mean that Wyoming would get high-speed rail before Texas, and that would just be really funny. Thank you for watching.